My Gmail is acting a little bit funny today. I hope it's, yeah, okay, it's working. So thanks everyone for joining. I think we'll have a couple of more people uh, from batch five joining us, but today we have a guest speaker, uh, Chris Miller or Christine Miller, who's a, according to LinkedIn, a biostatistician working on the data science team at Pivot Bio. And they were the, um, they provided the inspiration and the business uh, challenge for this week's challenge. And so Christine comes, finished her PhD um, and is working at, at the University of California in Davis and has been, um, yeah, I think in terms of the field you're working in, it seems like more in the area of biology or chemistry or biochemistry, or please correct me if I'm wrong. I would say agricultural ecology, but Agricultural doesn't really ecology. matter. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then after that, uh, moved into the area of data science. Um, and yeah, and Pivot Bio has been a company that's been uh, supporting us in different ways. We have, we, we had three and now two of our trainees are working uh, with Pivot Bio and one of our batch four alumni is working directly with uh, Chris. And um, yeah, I mean, nothing else to add from my side. I don't know, Yevabelle, if you have any context you want to provide. Otherwise, maybe Chris, we can hand over to you. But yeah. yeah I, just, I just want to say that, I mean, this challenge has been very useful in terms of diversifying um, our challenge in a way that it is big data, as well as also there was a clear, I mean, last time when Elle um, was helping to design the challenge, it was very, the contact and the information was very useful because we understand, okay, so something like this could be done uh, in many companies. So, and also it provides a context, a very good context for the trainees to know what kind of engineering are out there, like as a junior that they can really contribute that makes the life of, you know, um, senior data scientists or anyone in the company to be benefited from that kind of relationship while they are actually adding real value. And, and hopefully that kind of interaction is where we think the, the whole thing, academic training, producing highly talented junior data engineers or machine learning engineers could bring, like just facilitating that kind of, um, that engineering tasks that otherwise would take some time for by the senior data scientist or by the senior machine learning engineer, but um, but this time, you know, with, with this help. So anything in, in that area you want to talk about, like how this could be useful or what are similar contexts out there, like in your company that could benefit or that could juniors could tackle, you know, and anything like that would really use, be useful. So this is because I, I find it very um, niche, uh, just where in such a big, a lot more probably PhD driven, company where a junior can contribute, right? So um, yeah, just wanted to say that. Thanks again for also being willing to talk to the trains. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I am happy to be talking to you guys today and giving you a little bit of a uh, view into what my work as a data scientist is. Um, I was motivated to become a data scientist because I wanted particularly to work in the agricultural space. Um, agriculture needs a lot of help um, and I think we can make a lot of progress in making the way we grow our food um, more efficient, more sustainable, um, more accessible, fairer to lots of other people. And the agri-tech industry um, has a lot of players that are trying to do that, um, including Pivot Bio. Um, so for those of you that don't have a lot of background in agriculture, um, basically what we're trying to do is grow food um, and plants that grow food need certain things to do that. They need healthy soil, they need healthy roots, they need the nutrients they need. Um, we put on everything from 
products to try to keep them from getting infested with bugs to products to fertilize them and help them grow. Um, so in at Pivot Bio, we're trying to make a new kind of fertilizers um, that would be hopefully more sustainable and more affordable for farmers to use to grow um, all sorts of crops. Um, and like you may have read in your challenge, what we really want to know is how well our products work. Like we run a lot of experiments in fields that farmers are growing um, various different kinds of crops um, and we have certain areas of the field where we apply our new fertilizer and certain areas of the field we apply the fertilizer the farmers are already using and then try really hard to figure out <laughs> to compare the performance of those two um, areas of the field or more. Um, hopefully seeing that our product is doing better than what farmers are already using. Um, the problem is that fields are not the same all the way across the field. They're pretty, they can be really big from a hundred hectares big. Um, so there's a lot of change in how the plants grow in that area um, that has nothing to do with our new fertilizer or the old fertilizer um, and how those actually perform. So our job is to try to collect as much information as possible from various different sources that can tell us about how the plants um, are different in that field um, depending on how we treated them and can tell us about the different environments that the plants experienced while they were growing um, to like how sloped a surface of the field is, how much water they had, what kind of soil they were growing in, all that affects um, how the plant grows as much as our fertilizer may or may not do. Um, so yeah, this project is a pretty, some, a use case that we find a lot and that we have a source of data that can tell us more information about the fields that we're testing our product in. Um, and we need a quick and efficient way to get it. Um, so that we can incorporate it into analyses and test how well it helps us explain what's happening um, in all of our experimental fields. Yeah, I think that's basically the background I had. Okay. <laughs> Is there any mm -hmm. other are you, are, you, well, are you able to share, I mean, so as you were talking in, I mean, maybe what you were working on with Kate and what uh, Josh and Elias were working on, because I think it's probably the closest to what, as they went through the same course last year, if you're able to give a bit, a bit of an overview of that without obviously giving away too much, but yeah, that would be, I think, useful. Sure. I'm not as familiar with what Elias is working on, but I know Kate, um, who is a 10 Academy alumni. <laughs> is yeah. that how you refer to yourselves? Yeah. Yeah, and she's she was a, a Kenyan graduate from last year. So just for everyone yeah. who's on the call, yeah. But yeah, I think alumni is fine. Has made several similar tools for us while we've been, um, while she's been interning with Pivot. So she has um, a lot of the data, the public data we have and would like access to. Um, like maps of soil types um, or weather or uh, the history of a field are hosted on several different websites. Um, so Kate has built and maintained a tool, a software package that can download um, our soil data um, from a public website that's maintained by the government. 
Um, and she also just recently finished making another similar package to download um, the history of a field. So if you put in a GPS point or um, a box defined by the corners, uh, the corners of a box defined um, to define a field, you can uh, get back the primary crop that was grown on that field for the past 10 years, um, which can also help us understand what's happening in a field. Great, thanks. <clears throat> so I, yeah, I'm just gonna open it up to see uh, to the class and just see if there's any questions. It could be specifically related to uh, this week's challenge or questions around uh, use of data science in agriculture and maybe even um, ETL questions more generally, but yeah, so uh, Martin, as thank you for uh, the model works. You've put your hand up first, so I'm glad to know that it's actually, otherwise I'd be good. Martin always asks the first question, so I'm glad <laughs> to know Martin is still there. Martin, go ahead. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. It was very good, and uh, we have gotten to actually it's a very good experience to work with uh, geographical data and also with all the data that uh, we are normally given at an academy it gives us a wide range of uh, experience and uh, it's something good so i had uh, two questions so the first question that i wanted to ask is uh, with leader leader data uh, it's more towards the side of us is there like a way that uh, you guys are thinking of maybe uh making it also uh something like worldwide yeah that's the first question and the second question was uh when dealing with uh topography like uh, i saw there was that uh, particular concept of uh, topography wet index uh, what how do you handle if for example the type of soil that uh, one is uh, working with is maybe waterlogged type of soil so maybe uh, and you're you're doing the topography wet index which you want to look like at how much water accumulates to a certain area or a certain topography so what about how does how do you handle it together with the soil uh, data that uh, you might be able to collect yeah, also another thing, just uh, a parting shot is that uh, I love I love doing farming and I do a lot of farming, yeah, on my side there. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. I um, think I, I captured your questions, but remind me if I forget to answer a part of one. <laughs> um, oh, man. What was your first question again? Oh, uh, the first question was uh, whether it can, whether you guys are thinking of making it uh, like a worldwide project or it's just uh, based on the data that you're able to maybe like get. Uh, yes, um, I, we are definitely hoping to make our products worldwide products. Um, uh, we are it's complicated to get products ready to sell um, for in lots of different countries. And there's a lot of work that has to go into making that possible. Um, but there's also a lot of research that has to be done to make sure our product works in all the different environments of the world. So that's definitely our goal. And we've started close to home, but um, we're hoping that our product works well and in lots and lots of different environments and that we can spread all over the world. Chris, I have a related question. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you don't know, maybe it's not a good question, but is LiDAR data available for all parts of the world? Is it, or is it only like, in this case, US Geological Survey has to commission it and makes it available? Or is there, is this type of data or how, available is this type of data for non-US sources, non-US locations, I should say. I, I don't know the answer to that question. 
Okay. I know that LIDAR data can't be quite as easily captured as like the satellite images um, because you can't take it from satellites. You actually have to fly a plane over uh, okay. the, the fields or a drone. Like it's just, it's not something you can capture from space. So it's not um, quite as easy to get, but I bet you there's like researchers that are working on getting LIDAR images over as much of the world as possible. Okay. So that's expensive then. So somebody had to fly a plane or a drone over the US and collect this information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, back to uh, Martin's other questions, which yeah. I also don't remember. Otherwise, I would remind you. <laughs> <laughs> so Martin, you're going to have to. Your next question, Martin, was about um, how like elevation um, and topography interacts with soil type, correct? Yeah, that was the question. Yeah, um, you're very right that those two things uh, interact with each other. Um, there are some soils that hold water better and some soils that don't hold water quite as well. Um, I think the quick answer to your question is we try to gather information on both of those things and uh, then add them to our models so that we can try to understand the relationships between them and the interactions between them. Um, yeah, that's probably the simple answer. Hi, Elle. Um, Everyone, this is Elle. She can also answer lots of your questions about agricultural um, biotech stuff and data science. Yeah, maybe yeah. we could. Do you want to do a quick introduction, Elle? Yes. I'm so sorry for being late. There we were, was we were something, we yeah, were something unexpected <laughs> happened this morning. So um, I'm very happy to be here now. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Elle. It's short for Vora. Um, I. I actually lived in Ghana for two years, and then Kenya for two years, and then Rwanda for three years. And I'm really excited about Ten Academy because during all that time, I just met a lot of very smart young people. And I know that Ten Academy is full of very smart young people, and I'm very excited about um, just the opportunities that, that are there um, for online jobs and data science and data engineering and everything that you're studying. So I'll just say up front that I'm a big fan of Ten Academy. And of all the work and all the all the things that that you all are learning, um, my my path is a little bit different. I actually spent a good number of years being a process engineer, so I was working with um, like pumps and wiring, electricals and um, installations, and in, in that I figured out that I really like the data part of 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 running a factory or um, even all those machines having to understand from sensors like what's happening in the factory and pulling that all together to figure out a better way to run it and so that's how i got involved with data science originally was taking all this complex information and combining it i needed to learn python and machine learning and a few other tools so i really enjoyed that um, and then i've I've been at Pivot Bio for about three years, and a large portion of that was working with the field data. Um, data that's probably, that, that is very different than the LiDAR challenge, uh, but data that at the same time makes, makes it possible for us to choose which products we want to take from the field and turn them into products that we're selling to customers. And I think as the LiDAR challenge points out, like this is actually, it's really a tricky challenge because when we think about agriculture or growing food, there's so much variability. It's a natural system. It's not a machine. It's not a laboratory. Um, and when we're trying to choose products, the challenge is we want to know if there's a difference. Does this work better than something else? And when a field has a lot of natural variability, even if you do nothing to the field, one side of it will pro naturally produce more. 
So when you do an experiment in the field, how do you know that what you put in the field is actually producing more? Or it would have produced more anyway, because that side of the field has better soil, it has better access to water. So yeah, I, I just think that agriculture is a really interesting data challenge because it's constantly looking for this like signal when there's so much noise. Um, and I think the, the LIDAR challenge is a part of that. So that's, yeah, that's a little bit about um, my perspective. And I'm, again, so sorry to be late and I'm not sure where the conversation was before I jumped in, but I'm also happy to answer any questions. So we were just doing Q&A. Thanks, Al, for the, the intro. And I think that's really good to hear that perspective. I mean, I was personally surprised. Ag ag agriculture and data and the fact that I was just looking at the bio's website and it seems like there's two sides to it. There's the science of the microbes and there's the data science. And those seem to be the two scientific areas. So yeah, I, I never expected that much data to be used in the ag tech field. But I think Binyam had the next question, then Samuel. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and uh, Chris and Elle, uh, thank you for your presentations. It was good. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, can you hear me first? We can hear you, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So my question is, um, it's my understanding that your company's uh, research and development uh, as opposed to a production one. So uh, who are exactly your customers? Uh, uh, my that means uh, when you produce your products uh, who, who are you selling it to is it uh, other companies that produce your products in a large scale and distribute it and uh, uh, if that is the case um what is your uh, one of your uh, biggest issues you're trying to solve currently in uh, agriculture or uh, uh, agri-tech in general, and uh, how is uh, as, as, a, as a data scientist, how are you contributing to that uh, uh, issue or uh, idea? So thank you. If I, my question is not clear. Uh... Um, I would say, so your first question is, who are we selling to? Like whether it's directly to farmers or to another company that will produce our product. Um, so we are currently producing and selling our own product to farmers. Um, so our customer is the farmer. We do like contract with some other companies to up our production of it, but I'm pretty sure you can still say that we're selling it. Um, directly to farmers the the i i mean i do think that one of the challenges that we're trying to solve right now um is understanding like we we work in an agricultural system and our pr product sometimes performs better and sometimes performs worse and we're trying to understand why um, I think that's one of the big data science questions um, that we're trying to answer so that we can tell our customers more accurately how well this, what our product is going to do for them and when they should use it or not. Okay, uh, so the reason why I asked is because uh, for countries like Ethiopia or African countries in general, the issue agriculture is more of implementation than actual uh, uh, lack of uh, efficiency or something like that. Uh, but when it comes to developed countries like America, uh, you would think that uh, the, the issues are somewhat different because uh, uh, you have already developed so much technologies and uh, it's, it, it seems like you're producing efficient uh, efficiently so exactly what are the problems um, for the countries like america you've tried you're trying to tackle uh, uh, so does that make sense yeah i think the question i heard there is 
um, you know, America produces a lot of different technologies. I might even paraphrase what you say, what you said and say that there's an efficiency mindset that you're trying to do something faster, better, uh, with less money, et cetera. Um, and so your question was, what are the challenges if we're already creating um, efficient technologies? And this is a really interesting question for me. Um, I think the main challenge we're trying to address in the US is that farmers often over apply synthetic nitrogen. They put too much of it on the field in the US and this creates pollution it, because there's so much nitrogen the, well, basically in the US, half of the nitrogen that's applied either rushes away or it, it gets um, pulled into the rivers or evaporates into the air and it creates water pollution and air pollution. Um, and so the microbes, I mean, they are, they are more efficient. They live on the roots of the plant and they give the nitrogen directly to the plant. And so when farmers use our microbes, a lot of our challenge or our job is to give them confidence and trust that our microbes are supplying that nitrogen so they can reduce their synthetic nitrogen and therefore they can reduce the pollution that comes from it also. So that's a big challenge. And it's an interesting question for me because I'm learning a lot more about um, smallholder agriculture in, in East Africa, in Kenya, for example. And my understanding is the tendency is the opposite, that even when um, there's a lot of proof that synthetic nitrogen can help a smallholder farmer increase her yield, the tendency is to underapply. And there's other reasons for that. A lot of times it has to do with cash flow, like, you know, being able to purchase nitrogen at that time of the season is really hard. There just isn't the cash on hand. But for me, that that juxtaposition is very interesting that in the US that the issue is that the farmers apply too much fertilizer. And in Kenya, the challenge can be that the farmers, the smallholder farmers at least, um, don't apply enough to see the benefit from it. Um, I, did I answer your question or is, is there, was there another part of it that didn't get addressed? Yeah, you have answered it. Uh, and so it's my understanding that um... Currently, you're tackling the issue of uh, environmental problems associated with uh, usage of agriculture uh, technologies. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the main issues you're trying to tackle in America, uh, if I'm correct. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ed and uh, Chris, of course. Samuel, turn you next. Okay, hello El, hello Chris, and thank you uh, very much for setting up time for this Q&A session with us. Mm, really grateful. Uh, I don't know if my question will be repetitive, but I'll be on top of Martin and so I guess also asked on the chat box. So most of the data sets, uh, any data set of particularly, but as any in, in agriculture, the mostly is European or American data sets that have been, it's public, publicly available to all of us. So my question is, like you said, on one land there can be many, many different from one corner to the other. So even if we want to use in Africa, the same data, it wouldn't be like not little uh, lidar data, but other like that test the soil moisture ending uh, related to that. So is there any data source of a public data source available for African or any besides the European American countries? That's it. Yeah, that's a really excellent question. What I heard was um, what, what are the public data sets that are available for African countries? This is a little bit at the edge of my knowledge, but there are, um, for, so for example, there's satellite data that's public, um, Sentinel and Landsat, they are public globally. So you can access that information for any country in the world. Um, the, the resolution of Sentinel and Landsat, um, satellites tends to be like uh, low resolution. I think, for example, you you might have trouble finding like a a farm 
in a, in a country in Africa because the farms tend to be smaller and the pixel basically for those those satellites is is larger than that. Um, there's also an interesting group and maybe I'll look it up. And I believe they do provide public data sets, but they um, they compile a lot of different public data for different indices. For example, they use satellite data to and some other databases to look at what is the electricity distribution in different countries, especially in Africa, because you know you can imagine the satellite image does show at night which parts of the country are lighter or darker. And I think they combine that with some other public data sources to come up with a more refined data set. I don't remember the name, but I'll look it up in a minute and maybe I'll post it in the chat. But those are two public data sets that come to mind for me. Yeah, that covers basically what I know too. I know the satellite data is publicly available and I bet it would depend on the country within Africa what other sets of data are, are available. But I know I have friends who have used Landsat and Sentinel to do agricultural re research in West Africa. So definitely um, a resource that people use. Maron? Maron, did you have a question? Yes, I had a question. I'm sorry, I dropped out a call earlier. The connection. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you, Chris and Elle, for what you have presented for us. I'm not sure if someone asked while I was away, but my question was basically um, uh, from your experience in uh, Pivot Ag Agree. What is expected as a, from like generally basically the, what is expected from a junior data analyst or machine learning engineer? So what are like the basic things you expect uh, from us or from juniors such as us? I would say that people come in with some level of knowledge in statistics and or modeling to be an analyst um, and some level of knowledge in coding, some sort of uh, scripting languages, usually Python or R. Um, and like there's a lot of different levels within that. Um, but that's essentially the basics. I think I would Thank also you. add that for any job, I think that anybody takes on, there'll, there'll be some knowledge that, you know, that I learned in school, for example, but for any, actually for any job that I take on, I'll just talk for myself there's always a learning curve. It doesn't matter what I studied or where I went to school. I always have to learn new information when I join that job. And like, for example, at Pivot Bio, I think it's, um, it, the, it, it's the context, right? It's learning about agriculture. I had to learn a ton about agriculture when I started, even though I, I already had some experience with the data part. I had to learn um, the, the context around the numbers in order to ask good questions um, and to, yeah, make good analyses. I think another aspect that I always appreciate with junior analysts is, and maybe Arun has talked about this before because he and I have talked about it, but it's hunger, right? And um, like being proactive, which is to say that, you know, maybe I have an idea of a task and I say, okay, let's do A, B, and C. And you know, somebody goes away and they try to do A, B, and C, and they're like, oh, I got A, but turns out B is impossible. Like, this, this, this approach doesn't work. And so there's a couple of different options about how to handle that. Um, one is to just, like, wait till the next time you see me and, and say, this was impossible. What should I do? The other approach is to be like, well, you know, you said do B, but I, that didn't work. So here, I tried these other two things. Um, what do you think about that? And I think that, you know, being proactive and experimenting and trying things uh, without necessarily 
waiting to hear what the next steps are, I think that's a really useful skill. It's incredibly useful because one, you're going to generate more ideas than I have when, when you try new things or experiment with them. Um, and I, yeah, and I think that that skill also will serves people in any job that they have is the ability to like take a test. There's, there's usually something wrong with the test. We don't actually know what's going to happen when we try those things, but to be able to navigate and try something new and come back with more ideas, I think is extremely valuable. Yeah, I would say that's a great addition, Al. Um, just generally being able to talk to people um, and figure out what they need and um, is also a really important skill of data science. Um, yeah, often you're talking with people um, that have less of a background in computers or analytics and they just really want to know the answer to a question and it's really our job to figure out how to get them the best answer that we can um, or tell them that we can't answer their question <laughs> um, or how yeah. what we would need to answer their question um, right even the highlighting part of your response, Chris, like the listening parts, being able to, um, yeah, hear what somebody is asking for and ask more questions to understand what they what they really want, is super important. And I'll even I'll even put out there that like when I'm interviewing people for a role, in the interview, I'm often the thing I'm paying attention to most is, are you listening? Do you do you hear what I say and then ask more questions about it and try to answer it? Or do you already have an idea in your head and you're like running off and making another answer? So yeah, I think listening the part of Chris's answer is is so important. And can for me, it, it kind of splits a lot of like good candidates from excellent candidates because um, what it means for me is if you can listen to somebody and really try to pull apart what is the answer that they're actually looking for, it might not actually be the first thing they say. What it means is you spend less time coding because if you you know if you um, if you don't get to that that core of it or it takes you a long time you might go through a lot of iterations of an analysis and in some ways uh, if if you had asked a few more questions up front or really listened it could have been less iterations if that makes sense so the listening I think allows. Um, an analyst or good data scientist to kind of like focus in on the core of the work uh, and and spend spend less time on iterations. Um, that's that's one thought that comes to me. Al, do you want to just as as you're describing what makes a great data scientist, do you want to share some of the projects that uh, Ada worked on with you? Ada and Ada was also a Ten Academy grad, uh, someone from Batch Three, 2020. Yeah, absolutely. So it was, she really did a lot all over the board. Um, so some examples were like at the beginning, we were looking at um, NNI, which I think is the nitrogen nutrition index. One of those ends is wrong, but it, it basically, we were looking at, can you use satellite imagery to um, estimate the biomass of the corn in the field, like the corn plants? And also to estimate the nitrogen in their leaves. And there's a little calculation called NNI that helps you kind of determine if the plant is doing well or poor. So she actually did a literature survey looking across all these different um, academic articles to see where people had applied NNI and if there were pieces that we could use for us. So in particular, she was looking for places where they had multiple different locations um, that's actually one, one common thing with agricultural data science is you can get a really good model on one location and fit it really well, but then when you take it to the next location, it will fail uh, because every location is different. So when you're looking for um, good data science, you want it to be in multiple locations. Uh, and the other part she was looking at was applied to maize and in the U.S. And so she did a great literature survey and we kind of pulled some information around that. She also did, um, she did a lot of exploration with geospatial data, which I also think is a super interesting area if you like looking at 
maps like I do, um, there's a lot of interesting work that comes from working with satellite images and maps. And so one, one thing that she did for us was that she built a tool where um, we often get data back from growers that comes from their tractors, their farm machines. And basically what it is, is it's a bunch of little points, maybe something similar to the LIDAR data, but it's like the machine is going through the field and it takes a point of information. What we need to do is to be able to turn those masses of points into a plot boundary. And what that means is it's just the shape, right? Instead of a bunch of little points, we just want the shape of the points. Um, but usually there's, uh, it's, it's actually a very tricky problem because there's usually multiple pieces of the field. Like this part of the field will be blue points and the next part will be red and the next part will be green. And what we actually need is a, sh a red shape, a green shape and a blue shape. And it's actually algorith algorithm algorithmically tough to draw that shape accurately. It's like a task that a human can do pretty easily, but when you have hundreds of fields, you wanna reduce a human sitting in front of the computer and drawing shapes on hundreds of fields. So she actually experimented with different ways to approach that. And she came up with a solution that was about 80% accurate. Like it could draw pretty good shapes 80% of the time. And so reduce the, the human workload from hundred fields to just 20. Um, so that was some work that she did with geospatial da data. Um, she also worked with our data warehouse, which is where we ingest all of the field data. And there's often a challenge there for like data completeness because it's not just being put up there by a few people. It's like a team of dozens and dozens of people working in different places in different ways. And often by the time you get back to the analysis, there's things that are missing, like planting dates. When was the field planted? And that's really important because you, for a number of different reasons, but one example is you want to know when to start looking at satellite imagery. If you don't know when the field was planted, that you, you, um, the, the images may be off, right? So she did some work in, in getting our data warehouse into shape, which was one, looking for some of these data holes and then writing scripts to fill them. Um, should we get the information from people and fill them? The other, she also wrote a tool that, um, help condense the information from the data warehouse because it's very raw and so in her case the tool what it did was it looked at let's say we want to look at one particular measurement like nitrogen concentration we uh for we in the field we cut um in the field we take samples like we take leaves from the corn plants the maize plants and we send them to the lab the lab measures what percentage of nitrogen is in the leaf so that, so then the question is, okay, we measure nitrogen concentration across a lot of different experiments, which experiments have nitrogen concentration in them? So she built a tool that took all the raw data from the data warehouse and was able to summarize, you know, I wanna know about which tools have plant, or sorry, which experiments have plant height and being able to condense that or which experiments have nitrogen concentration, how many of the locations do we measure that at? Um, and that was, so yeah, that's, that's, an, that's another bit of the work she did there. So th I think that was three examples. One was just, uh, academic literature review of this is ways that other people use satellite imagery to make estimations about what's happening in the field. Another part was like geospatial, working with geospatial data and creating, um, plot boundaries from basically point data. Um, and then the third one being, you know, working with our data warehouse in both like improving the information that was there, but also building tools that help us see better what's, what's inside the data warehouse so that we can plan our analyses. So that was three examples. She did a lot more than that, <laughs> but I will, I will leave those, those examples there. Um, and Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about, um, Kate or the current 10 Academy grads, other examples there. Um, we have a little bit. I talked about some things that Kate had been doing that are similar to the LIDAR task. Um, she also has done many more things like building web applications um, to help us flexibly see what data is available for different fields and help some of our lab science teams 
um, quickly analyze their data um, and has done a lot of work with making sure data is in the data warehouse, putting it there, inventorying it, lots of those things too, in addition to many other things. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, maybe we can go to Yudidia's question. Uh, so he asks, are there any other ways and data sources other than LIDAR, other than LIDAR that Pivot Bio uses to study soil and agriculture? So I think we talked about satellites. Are there others that you use? Yeah. Um, so for example, we are you we try to use weather data when we can. Um, that is another big public data set that we use, or we usually pay for a service to be able to get weather data back. But um, things like how much sun or how much rain um, a plant or a crop has received during its key growth stages or what temperature it was um, really determines a lot about um, both the environment for the plant to grow in, but also the environments our microbes do well in, um, how wet the soil is, how dry the soil is, if there were huge rain events that washed everything out of the soil um, or vice versa. Um, so that's one source of information we get. Um, we also get information about what type of soil there is in the U.S. they have done several big nationwide surveys of soil types and have put together maps that cover most of the U.S. on what type of soil there is. Uh, we also take samples ourselves and analyze them for the soils in the fields that we're do doing experiments in. Um, yeah. Can you think of any other big sources of data, Al? No, I can't. I mean, it's not public, but we do take a lot of samples that we send to the lab. There's a lot of people out collecting soil samples and plant samples in the field, and there's this whole team that works on getting that information up. Um, but I think you covered the public data sets pretty well, Chris. Yeah, um, just to so most of the question in the chat is so most of your data source comes from lidar um i wouldn't say that's true um lidar is a very specific kind of data and we are actually still experimenting with um what value it gives to our analyses um so a very small amount of our data is actually lidar at the moment um but we, uh, we work with a lot of sources of data that we don't collect ourselves and a lot of data that we do. Yeah, I think the other part is that, you know, I just mentioned all these manual samples that we're taking. Like, it's like dozens of people out cutting samples, packaging them up, sending them to the lab. The lab gets overwhelmed. We send them too many samples. They can't get them back in time. And so really a challenge for us is, and the ongoing challenge is, how do we use remote sensing to replace some of that work or to cut it down? Because it's really, it's hard, it's expensive. Um, and so that's something that we're continually experimenting with. And maybe Chris explained this earlier, but the LIDAR, we, we don't actually use the public LIDAR data set. Um, we, we have, a team that does drone flights and there's lighter sensors on the drones. The reason why is because we're really interested in um, the shape of the plants and the plants change every season. And that data set, as far as I know, the public one that you, that you all are working with is static. So even if it included the fields we wanted to look at, the data would not be, it'd be from a past season. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, it's just an ongoing challenge. We would love to be able to tell more about our fields and our products remotely. And it's really hard, it turns out. <laughs> it's hard to beat someone going there and taking a sample and sending it to, to the lab. I think Jonas has a question. 
Hello. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Chris and Al. Uh, so, uh, my one of my questions was, uh, what a junior data scientist shall expect from companies like Pivot Bio, like since the environment is new for uh, junior data scientists like me. So, what shall a junior data scientist expects from companies so so that uh, he or she can adapt him or herself very quickly to the environment. So, so what are the things that are normally exist like in companies that hire junior data scientists? So that's my question. Thank you. If I'm clear. Yeah, so I heard you ask about what would a junior di junior data scientist expect from a company like ours. Um, I'll answer a few bits, but I'm not. Sh we'll see if that answers your question. So our company is mostly remote, especially the data part of it, and so there's typically like a weekly team meeting where everybody syncs up. There's also typically like one on ones with your manager to look at how how you're doing, how your work is going, if there's any blockers, how you're doing emotionally, if you're stressed out. Um, and I think a large part of the work is, you know, syncing up with your team or your manager to understand what the challenge is and how you can address it and then pursuing it on your own and coming back and checking in. I think that's typically the, the pattern, at least at our company. There is actually a lot of time on your own working on the problem and then you know with if if you run into blockers or there's questions there's slack um but of course there's a time difference between the us and ethiopia for example so there might just be certain hours that people in the us are able to answer questions by slack um and then i think at least on the on the data science team there's also a meeting where people just share their work it, it's and it's work that's supposed to be like kind of half finished to get input like hey i'm trying this what do you think about it uh and getting input from other team members or ideas or I, i'm not quite sure how to address this what do you guys think um so that's a little bit kind of how the experience might be like or what the rhythm is like does that answer your question or was there something else in particular that you wanted to hear about? Yeah, it, it answers my question, but just to add, like, what are the things that these junior data scientists are mostly challenged that you don't expect others to, to repeat when they, like, at the time of, like, during their first few months of work? So is the question about the type of work that they're expected to do? I heard the phrase, you don't expect others to repeat. And I'm not sure I understand that. Could you um, ask it in a different way, maybe? So can I maybe interpret? I think, Jonas, what you're asking is, what gaps have you seen? And you would hope that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jonas, what gaps do you hope that, OK, people who are graduating this year don't come in with the same gaps? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, Maybe, a, go ahead. Yeah, Chris. that's a tough question. Um, I think that <laughs> I think that Pivot does a really good job, and smaller companies in general do a good job of expecting each of their employees to actually be individuals with the different backgrounds. Um, so it's really hard to generalize something that like everyone tends to be deficient in um, or not. Um, so I think that coming into a company like Pivot, you, your manager or the people you work with would be happy to try to work out and support you in getting up to speed and we would be expecting um, 
uh, a period where you're learning where your skills fit in, you're both learning um, what your skills are and where you want to grow. Um, I think um, really the thing that makes people very successful is the ability to be open and kind of like what Elle said before, having ideas, um, putting them forward, um, having the hunger and the motivation to really try to um, do the best they can and like bring what they have to the table and be open about that so that you can identify and fill gaps quicker and just have two brains working on a problem instead of instead of one. Yeah, that completely makes sense to me, Chris. As I think the expectation is, again, everybody learns a lot on their job. We all walk into jobs. I walk into many jobs with gaps. And I know that my my challenge and my, and my job is to be hungry, to figure out what I don't know and start teaching myself and ask questions and get help. Um, and I think for me, when I think about new hires, what sets apart a good hire from an excellent one is I think the excellent one um, is a little bit fearless. Like they jump into like, okay, I don't know this, but I'm going to learn it and I'm going to ask these questions um, and I'm going to keep trying things. Even though the first time I tried it, it didn't work. I'm going to try another thing and I'm going to ask for some advice like, hey, I, this didn't work. What should, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, that, that proactiveness. Um, I think, you know, we can talk about geospatial tools, we can talk about Python, and we can build up your skills in in different technical ways. But I think it's it's a little bit hard to think about how to teach someone to be more proactive. It it's something that I think often comes from inside the person, you know, this hunger, I, I want to learn this. Um there's there's ways that we can create like there's ways to create an environment where people feel safer, like they're they're not afraid to fail because they know that um, they're not going to be punished for it, right? Some environments are like that. If you turn in the wrong answer, then you get an F. And I think um, at Pivot Bio, it's a little bit different. It's like, oh, I tried this. It didn't work. And the next step is, well, who, who else can you talk to? What are different ways that we can approach this? So when I think about what is you know, what is this skill that I, I really hope new hires bring on? It's that hunger, knowing that they're going to have to learn a lot and and being willing to, to throw themselves in and learn those things. And also just that quality of being proactive, trying different things, trying again, doing it over and over, and um, perhaps not being afraid to try that. So it's maybe in your question, you were looking for some tactical skill, <laughs> but I think for me at least it's it's that's maybe what you would call a soft skill is that that hunger and that ability to like dive in and want want to learn more so maybe we're out of time but rafa had her hand up i'd love to hear from rafa as well and maybe we can wrap up but chris or Al, if you need to drop off please feel free but rafa over to you yeah hi aaron and thank you chris and al for this nice conversation and like Given us from your time to provide this Q and A session. So, yeah, uh, and also it's nice to like learn from someone who is just uh, in the field of agriculture because I don't have any um, any previous background about agriculture. And uh, when I just had this challenge of agritech, I just look at it as uh, technical more and so as you just said uh, that about uh, there are many parameters when it just comes to real agriculture i don't know how you really guys handle with that like wh where how do you decide exactly which parameter that you want to just ignore completely or which one you are just going to focus on and so on and yeah is there any way that you do this in uh, real analysis
you're totally right. That is something we struggle with all the time. <laughs> we yeah. often end up in a position where we feel like we both have way too little and way too much data at the same time. Um, and lots and lots of different um, possible things that could explain what we're seeing in the things we care about. Um, I think that one thing we constantly keep in mind is the reality that agriculture is affected by lots and lots of different things. So all the patterns we see, um, it, it's okay if there's only a small thing because that's probably real. Uh, only a small relationship because that's probably real. Um, we also use a lot, we lean a lot on our domain experts like the agronomists or lab scientists, people that are closest to the data to um, help us think about what the most important things are to consider um, both like over in whole season um, within an agricultural system in general, but also like within a given field, they can tell us things like this field used to have a barn under it and this weird spot here is always going to have low yields. Um, so it goes, we lean a lot on expert knowledge and we try as many things as we have the time to try. Yeah, I see. Makes sense. And um, I don't know if this other question will make sense or not, but I'll just post it. So if there is kind of a virtual agreed like game or something that would like uh, people will try to play with the parameters and just have this data set somewhere. Like I really don't know if that like exists somewhere or not before I, I didn't check it. But yeah, so would that kind of um, like give some outputs or would be helpful somehow or? I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you please repeat it? Yeah, because I'm not sure if it makes sense or not, but it's just kind of, you know, um, there is type of uh, some of virtual, like uh, kind of agriculture somehow mm -hmm. to be a platform where people can try to play with the parameters, and it would be like for public, not just for you, but be like uh, some mm -hmm. to be used by public. And would that make sense if like millions of people, so for instance, who played with that, uh, will give you kind of. Um, insights or it just like will be like meaningless i see right. you're talking about those like game challenges that are trying yeah. to mm -hmm. um al do you have an answer to that okay uh well where where my mind immediately went to is in the u.s lots of universities they do publish tools that help growers kind of like play with the conditions of their fields and try to figure out how much nitrogen to apply but it's not exactly a game. I think that's an interesting thought. It's more just like, it's kind of labeled more like a business tool, like put in your parameters and then we'll give you an estimate on how much nitrogen you should apply. Um, yeah, I, it seems like a really interesting approach, but I don't, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to your question, but the other thing it makes me think of is, you know, um, what is random forest, right? A random forest model is like lots of smaller models uh, that have partial information or they, they don't have access to the whole data set or the whole model. But when you take all those like semi-independent answers and you put them together, you get an answer that's better than any individual one. Or there's a very similar concept like ensemble learning where you take different models that are independent from each other and you average the answer. And so when I hear your idea about like a game that millions of people are playing, I immediately start thinking about like, oh, all those people, they might like there's a all the answer, you know, if everybody plays the game and they come to some conclusion, that conclusion might be better than any one of those those people alone. Um, I think it's I think it's a very interesting idea. Um, 
I, what are your thoughts, Chris? I guess my thoughts are, I, my mind goes to that there are many like models or simulations of agricultural systems um, or different parts of agricultural systems that kind of make a virtual field and you can play around with how much fertilizer you add or what the soil type is or things like that and um, it can help you understand the system better um, and there's many models like that and we do use some of them and some of them are public um, that lots and lots of scientists have been working on trying to make as good as possible um, but they're not quite the game but we do use those sort of models to try to test things that we can't test in the field or in the greenhouse quite as easily and do virtual experiments in those computer environments. So just in the interest of time, I just wanted to, so I find it always fascinating to hear how uh, organizations like yours are applying data science and in my mind, we start to be thinking about the skills that one needs to be useful in work, but also knowledge and ideas and attitudes. And I think you've covered each of those today in terms of the work that you're doing and also what you're looking for. Um, so thank you for your time. I'd like to ask someone from the class to unmute and just offer a vote of thanks to our two guest speakers today. Or maybe just put up your hand and the first person can just offer a quick vote of thanks. Martin, thank you. The model still works. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, just say thank you for taking your time to come and explain to us uh, concerning leader, concerning uh, geographical data, concerning all these things that uh, I'm sure to many of us is new, but uh, we are finding it very, very interesting. And I believe that it will be a huge uh, privilege uh, for us to be able to not only just interact uh, at this level, but also to interact even further and uh, besides just uh, uh, over here in, in, ten, in this 10 Academy Forum. And we are also grateful to the organizers. That is, uh, I'd like to also thank Arun and Yabebal uh, it's been a very uh, good opportunity because uh, there are so many things that uh, Elle and Chris have spoken about and which we have been able to learn and we really appreciate that. So we appreciate your effort, Elle and Chris, and we also appreciate your effort, uh, Arun and Yabebal. Then I'd also like to appreciate the entire 10 Academy fraternity. Uh, we are happy that at least uh, we are learning so much. And I'm also happy because uh, the fact that you guys are able to uh, come here, ask questions and all that, it just shows that uh, you really desire to have uh, to work with uh, many people and also you really have that grit to go through all the way because right now we are in week, uh, we are in week, we are in week seven, we are in week six, I mean and it's just a good thing so uh thank you seven, all seven we're in week seven we're in week you... seven sorry about that uh, it's because of the week zero i think uh... you're traveling through time martin <laughs> maybe yeah so uh i think uh i'd just like to say thank you to everybody and uh that's all uh i'll say from my end i'll pass it over to i don't know martin, that's an oscar worthy speech thank you that's <laughs> Anyways, no, thanks, thanks, Al, thanks, Chris, and uh, yeah, have have a great day. It's it's morning for you guys, it's evening for us, but thanks, and have a great day. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.